Hello everybody, and today's hot topic is NVIDIA's fiery Fermi flagship, the GTX 480. Back in 2010, this was the fastest single GPU graphics card in the world, but it was plagued with issues before and after it hit the market. So why is it still able to run games 14 years later, and what caused it to become NVIDIA's worst nightmare? In every sense of the word, the GTX 480 was a beast. A hot, expensive beast that hit the market 6 months late, but a beast nonetheless. It used NVIDIA's flag flagship GF100 processor, which comes with 480 cores, 60 texture mapping units, 48 render output units with 1.5GB of GDDR5 VRAM and a 384-bit bus width. The reference model came with a core clock of 701MHz, a shader clock of 1401MHz, and a memory clock of 924MHz, all for the low price of $500. There were many reasons for these delays, but it essentially came down to Nvidia not doing their homework. See, the GF100 was a massive die at 529mm squared, and this was the first time Nvidia attempted to use TSMC's 40 nanometer process on such a large die. The issue is that the construction of these transistors had quite some variation, and led to a yield of only 2% on the first lot of Fermi chips. That's also why the 480 was so hot. The variability seen in these transistors meant this some were more leaky or ran slower than others. If you don't know, the leakage current is basically the unintended flow of electricity your current in a circuit, often occurring due to transistor level imperfections. They could fix the slower transistors by upping the voltage, but higher voltages caused the leaky transistors to leak more, which created more heat, and more heat makes the leaky transistors leak more. Architecturally, it was flawed. The GF100 was arranged into 16 clusters of 32 shaders for a total of 512 shaders, so they couldn't pick and choose which specific shaders to disable. They had to deactivate a full cluster of 32 shaders, which is why the GTX 480 only has 480 shaders rather than the intended 512. Since this core configuration isn't what Nvidia initially advertised, this caused some reviewers to speculate that a follow-up 485 or 490 card was undoubtedly on the horizon, but this never came to fruition. Some were even able to locate leaked engineering samples of the original GTX 480 with all 512 shaders unlocked. However, it only performed 6% faster while consuming 43% more power, so it makes sense that we never saw such a card and had to wait until the 500 series to get a Fermi 2 card with all 512 cores. But you can't really blame TSMC. ATI's 5000 series also used the 40 nanometer process and didn't face these issues. They did have some problems with them for their RV740 processor, but were able to learn from their mistakes and work around them for the 5000 series. That's why ATI was able to release their cards 6 months before Nvidia and aren't notorious for their excessive thermal output. ATI was a essentially on top at this time. Their 5870 was in direct competition with the 480, and although it only had about 90% of its performance, it cost $100 less. Meanwhile, the 480 was known for being expensive and extremely hot, pulling about as much power as ATI's dual GPU graphics card, the 5970. It wasn't even abnormal for the 480 to hit upwards of 90 degrees Celsius, and some even cooked eggs on these cards. ATI even made a skit about a SWAT team raiding a suspected grow house, which turns out to be just some guy with a 480. Still, the first generation of Fermi cards wasn't a complete flop. There's not much good to say about it, but it did set the stage for the successful 500 series, and the 460 was an excellent mid-range card with more performance than comparable Radeon cards in the same price range. So that brings us to today. 14 years later, and I got my hands on a lightly used GTX 480 in its original box for only $20. Taking apart the card, and we find that it's in excellent condition. There are some signs of buildup, but the interior and exterior were mostly clean. The underside of the heatsink also reveals a copious amount of dried up thermal paste used to cool this huge IHS. This is also the first time I've seen a graphics card with a heat warning sticker, which I probably should have heated later in the video. Aside from that, this card was made by EVGA with a slightly different shroud, but the same clock speeds and PCB cutouts as the reference model. Now, everything I've said so far hits at this card being a failure, but its performance in modern games was nothing short of surprising. For the test bench system, System, we'll be using an i7-4790 with 16GB of RAM and a half terabyte SSD running Windows 10 Lite. Driver installation finished up quickly and we were able to run a slight overclock of 200MHz on the shader and 140MHz on the memory with the default voltage. So how does it perform in modern games? Fortnite was up first and gave me this lovely driver warning issue which I was luckily able to bypass and get into the game. It automatically configured the settings to the lowest possible with a 3D render resolution of only 
only 50%. 1080p was a pretty common gaming resolution back in 2010, so I ran it with that and ended up getting an average frame rate of 67 FPS. It was very consistent as well, with 1% lows of only 32. And aside from the horrible loss in graphical quality, the game ran smoothly and peaked at only 74 degrees Celsius. At this point, modern gaming actually seemed plausible on this card, so we hopped into the finals with somewhat nonsensical dreams of a playable frame rate. This one also threw a warning and said that the 480 was below the minimum system requirements, but it still launched. We played this one with the same settings as Fortnite in 1080p with the lowest settings and a render resolution of 50%. It got an average of 22 FPS with 1% lows of 14. Still, I was able to get a kill, but this is not exactly what I would consider playable. Now, no amount of overclocking was going to fix these issues, so we moved on to Cyberpunk 2077, which crashed. The same thing happened in Crisis Remastered, but Apex Legends was at least able to start. We also played this one in 1080p with the lowest settings and an adaptive render resolution to 30 FPS. Once again, not great, garnering an average of only 24 FPS in 1080p and 27 FPS in 720p. This kind of demonstrates that the card has aged like milk, but these are modern AAA titles and anything even close to a playable frame rate is a feat for a 14 year old graphics card. GTA 5 for the PC was released only 5 years after the 480, so we decided to crank the settings as high as possible and see what happened. Considering how quickly technology was advancing back then, the 480 actually exceeded my expectations. We also exceeded the VRAM limitations, using 2.4 out of the available 1.5 gigs of memory. Still, it managed to get an average frame rate of 56 FPS and ran extremely well. GTA 5 is a very well optimized game, especially considering how good it looks, but seeing it run well on hardware that's over a decade old will never fail to surprise me. Far Cry 4 came out only 4 years after the GTX 480 did, and keep in mind that this was $500 when it released. It didn't run well at all, and got an average of only 30 FPS in 1080p with the low settings. I tried dropping it down to 720p, which raised the average up to 56, but was still disappointing. I did try overclocking the card a little bit further, but it didn't really make a difference. We're gonna rapid fire the last few. Counter Strike 2 looked like Tetris. I had to run it in a resolution of 1366 by 768 because 720p wasn't an option, and I knew 1080p was gonna be a bad idea. It got an average of 51 FPS, which is all right, but was less than I expected. I made a video about this game with the HD 5750, and ATI's card actually outperformed it, getting 55 FPS in 1080p, and that was a much cheaper card. Rocket League with the quality preset, aka the high but not ultra settings, got an average of 92 FPS in 1080p with 1% lows of 39. Competitively playable, it ran great and was smooth throughout testing. BeamNG Drive didn't run quite as well. With the low preset in 1080p, it got an average of only 31 FPS with 1% lows of 24. It also said that I was below the minimum system requirements of a 550 Ti, but this card is faster than that one, so I don't know what the devs mean. Next was PUBG with the very low settings in 1080p, where it got an average of 39 FPS with 1% lows of 29. I actually managed to get a kill in this one, and although it was definitely far from an ideal experience, it was actually surprisingly playable. I was also monitoring the GTX 480's temperatures throughout all the gameplay tests, and it peaked in PUBG, with a highest temperature of 78 degrees Celsius. Considering how much information online points to this car routinely hitting 90 degrees Celsius and its notorious reputation, these figures were very surprising. I've also long since lost the side panel for this case, so we got a sort of open air design going and this thing was radiating heat throughout testing. If I would have had it in a proper closed chassis, it definitely would have gotten much hotter. Regardless, these were some pretty impressive results from a 14 year old card. I guess the 480 still does have a place in the modern gaming landscape of 2024. Realistically, only for low end games, but its capabilities were honestly nothing short of surprising. It seems like I had just enough support for higher DirectX levels to be able to start most modern games, but not enough horsepower to effectively run them. Maybe one day, I'll overclock this card to the point of self-destruction, but that day is not today. Also, all that information about the Fermi Electronics I got from Charlie Damergian. He wrote an awesome article about it, and I'll link it below. It is an amazing read. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider leaving a like or subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. If you want to join the community, there's a link to the official Jane Dye Discord server in the description where we talk about a variety of stuff. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below, and I'll be sure to respond to them. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.